Hand loaders, bullet casters, welcome back to my bench. Welcome back to our discussion on the bullet path, where we will finally travel through the barrel and out of the muzzle. Today, we are going to take some measurements of our groove diameter. This little illustration right here will give you a pretty good representation of what that muzzle end will look like. We have lands and grooves that are cut into the barrel. The lands here are actually what's going to do the engraving. And the grooves are actually where the, the cut is deepened into the barrel which is actually a cut into the bore if that makes any sense folks so what we're going to do is end up taking an impression similarly to how we measured our throats to find out what the diameter is from one land to the opposite now as revolver shooters cast bullet hand loaders of revolvers one thing that is going to make this separate than dealing with auto loaders with our rifles is something called a barrel thread restriction but once we're past that we're pretty much home as far as any kind of barrel that's rifled whether it be rifle bolt action lever action auto loading uh handguns auto loading handguns revolvers single shots you name it if it's a rifled barrel once we get past this little area we are home free into the lands and grooves starting our spin out the muzzle end of the barrel now if you look at this drawing here something that you have seen me make a note of is this barrel to frame thread now, as I spoke in my video about the barrel cylinder gap, where I use that as an opportunity to point out that the revolver is made up of multiple parts and the barrel and the frame are technically not permanently affixed. They're screwed in together. And this can make things kind of complicated for us as revolver shooters because there's something that happens right here in this area during the very act of screwing a barrel into the frame. Now I have here for you my trusty little GP144 special that we've been taking measurements on and we're going to continue our measurements with this revolver. And what I just want to remind you of one, we need to make sure the gun is unloaded, and indeed it is. But the reason why I'm bringing this back out is just to show you an approximation of where this barrel screws in. Now, you'll notice at the top of the screen, I have here, and oops, it's upside down. I have here a Colt Trooper barrel and 357 Magnum. <laughs> this barrel was given to me by a gunsmith. It was a takeoff, and there's actually several jacketed hollow point bullets stacked up in it. Let's see if you can kind of see. I'll show you a little bit more when I get a chance for that, but it's pretty dark in there. And <clears throat> anyways, Nobody could get the bullets out, at least not in any kind of cost-effective way, so the barrel was removed, and it ended up on my bench. So I'm using it here as a display. Now, the way I have this revolver and this barrel lined up together should give you a pretty good idea of how this barrel screws into the frame. And the reason why this is important is because there's something that happens in that area that we need to know about. I'll see if I can bring us in for a little bit closer shot. Maybe we can get a pretty good eye on those threads. Those threads are very fine. And the concept here is that if we can thread this barrel into a frame tight enough 
so that it will never ever come loose so that it will forever act like the frame and the barrel are one solid piece because it certainly feels that way when we handle the revolvers but they're not and if we're familiar with how metals move how metals swell then something that we'll notice and understand is that there may become a restriction right here in this part of our barrel just from the very act of tightening this barrel down into the frame it's got to be tight i don't know what the torque specs are but however you see the measurements that we're working with you see how a little bit goes a long way we're not worried about whether we can see the tolerance difference with our eyes we want to measure it we're putting our measurements under a microscope and thousandths of an inch that matters folks you'll never see it but if you measure it it's there and your bullet when it exits that throat bring you back up here folks when your bullet which is fit to this throat because that's what we discussed that's what we decided we're going to do because a good fitting bullet will help keep the gas behind the bullet then as it comes through here through this forcing cone what if this little area where the barrel has been tightened down what if a restriction builds up in there that brings it down a thousandth of an inch a half a thousandth of an inch possibly more and it opens back up out here so we worked really hard let's just use simple numbers let's say this is a 432 thousandths exact diameter bullet and it's traveling through a perfectly made throat it hits this forcing cone let's say the groove diameter is also 432 thousandths it's not necessarily ideal but it happens and we go through this restriction that constricts that diameter down by another thousandth of an inch well now we've just taken our 432 thousandths of an inch bullet dropped it down in size to 431 thousandths passing through here and we're plunging it out through that barrel as an undersized bullet by a thousandth of an inch no wonder we're building up all kinds of lead in the lanes and grooves up here because our bullet that fit over here does not fit over here thanks to this barrel thread constriction now folks i'm not going to tell you that every single revolver out there has a problem um in fact, a lot of them don't. The information that I'm giving you is information that I want you to just file away because it might be a problem that you encounter. Some of you have ran patches through your gun and you've noticed that it's not always running through at a consistent rate sometimes you encounter resistance fortunately here i have zero resistance i think ruger did a pretty good job here i'm gonna slug this barrel here in a little bit and that's gonna tell us even further if there's a restriction ah and here i have turned my gp100 into a black hawk magic folks but now i want to show you on this one I'm not sure if a restriction exists, but it might be cool for us to just take a look and find out. Once again, a simple check, we need to reveal that this firearm is unloaded. And we'll pull this cylinder out. It's just so simple. It's so easy to do on these single actions that uh, it's kind of hard to not pull it out when you're working on it. So I've got my 45 jag hooked up in a patch 
let's see if we encounter resistance on this one here. Nice easy entry. We're trucking along, everything is even, everything is smooth. I'm not encountering any resistance that's greater than one point or another. However, now I feel like there may be a slight constriction. Just before this patch made it through, there was a noticeable slowdown. So does this mean this revolver is no good? Does it mean that I can't shoot cast in it? Does this mean that I am just going to have to trade it in for another gun? No! I've shot cast many times in this gun. Is it my best shooting lead gun? No, it's not. But it's a great shooting gun. And cleanup is simple. Folks, just because a restriction exists doesn't mean it's a problem. However, if there is an actual problem, you're going to notice it because you're going to see that lead build up. You're going to deal with it and you're going to be cussing at your gun all night while you work to clean it out. I don't have that problem here, folks. A restriction may exist. That doesn't mean it's a problem. File that information away. Don't dwell on it unless you are having some issues. There are some corrective actions that might be able to resolve your problem. Now, folks, this issue of barrel constriction, if it is giving you problems, if you just simply cannot enjoy shooting cast lead from it because cleanup is a nightmare and it's building up and it might even be causing an unsafe condition, a gunsmith may be able to lap it out for you. I wouldn't recommend trying it yourself and Honestly, I wouldn't recommend just giving the gun to any gunsmith to do because it's something that requires experience. It's something that requires almost a specialization. Now, there's also another method that is preferred by a lot of people. However, it can be kind of tricky. If you're watching this, you're probably already a hand loader. You probably already deal with casts. I have not done this, but I've read a lot about it. There is a concept called fire lapping. Now, if we have this fire lapping kit, what we're ultimately going to do is load some very low velocity cast bullets and they'll be coated with some type of an abrasive. <sighs> It doesn't sound great, but guys, if you really think about the logic behind it, there's no reason this can't work. It is controversial because a lot of people do say that those abrasives will not only lap out that restricted part, they will also lap out the rest of the barrel and smooth out the rifling. Do a little bit of homework on it. See what you think works and give it a try. If you have done this, I would like to hear your input. I would like to hear your feedback because this sounds like a great option for most of us who don't really have access to a gunsmith that's able to do this kind of work. Folks, once again, we're going back to using some soft lead slugs to basically take an impression of the inside diameter of our barrel. Now, we did this already with our throat, and essentially we're doing the exact same thing again. However, in light of what I told you about this restriction, it stands to reason that this slug is not going to give us a perfect picture of the diameter of our grooves. The reason why is we're going to get an impression of the most restricted spot in the barrel. Now, this point here is great because now we're away from exclusively revolvers. We are open up to rifle. We're open up to handguns, uh, semi-automatic handguns. Anything that has rifling, even an old single shot, you know, we're able to do this. We're able to find out 
what the groove, potential groove diameter is. However, we must remember, all we're really doing is getting a snapshot of the most constricted portion of the barrel. Now, imagine for a moment that the shaft of this marker represents the groove diameter of the barrel from the muzzle to the breech. What if right here at the muzzle end, the inside groove diameter is actually larger than at the breech end? What kind of problems can we have from that? It, the groove diameter is opening up as we get closer and closer to the muzzle. So what does that do for our bullet? What does that do for gas cutting? Once again, we've only measured the most restricted spot of the barrel. What if it's the other way around? What if we start kind of large right here, but it slowly tapers? down well now we've only actually measured again the most restricted spot which is the muzzle end of that barrel now those last two situations i much prefer the second i would rather have a shrinking groove diameter than an expanding because we can steadily seal those gases up as that bullet is traveling so folks, once again, I have enlisted here the help of the Big Mean Orange Vice, and i am got this gun set up so that we can uh, basically pound a soft lead slug through it. Now, I want to give a word of advice. <laughs> You're going to see this big steel hammer. <laughs> okay, don't hit your gun with this hammer, folks. There's no reason to do that, but you might find that a rubber mallet just simply isn't enough to get it started. We're going to try that first. However, good chance we're going to get it started with the big steel hammer. We're going to need something to drive that slug through. I'm using some brass punches. Some people use cleaning rods, and if you have a small enough caliber, that might actually work well. Just don't use a steel cleaning rod, folks. A lot of people also like to use wooden dowels. There's nothing wrong with that. However, you might want to tape up the dowel with some duct tape because apparently some folks out there have had some problems with their wooden dowel splitting and splintering, and then they've actually created a problem instead of taking a measurement. Now, do you have to have a vice? No. I think they're helpful, so I use them when I can. I've taken many of these uh, measurements without a vice. A lot of times you can just hold the gun in one hand and smack that slug started through with the other. If you're using a 45 ACP barrel or other semi-auto type, <laughs> hopefully you're a bullet caster because let me tell you something. These little ingots that you've seen laying around make outstanding anvils. They're non-marring. You can bang on them. Get you one if you don't have one, at least for a good surface for your kinetic bullet puller hammer. So folks, this is about all that I really want to put on you for one video today. So. We're going to pick up the rest in the next video where I end up running that slug through and taking some measurements. We'll talk a little bit about what we came up with. So in the meantime, folks, like, subscribe, and we'll see you soon.